Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, or so the saying goes, and if that's true, then video games are probably one of the most complimentary industries out there. Game designers have been borrowing ideas and taking inspiration from each other's projects for pretty much as long as there's been more than one company in the business, some being a bit more brazen than others. Usually it proves rather difficult to copy a truly brilliant idea, but there are cases where the second game to hop on the bandwagon is able to meet or even exceed what its predecessor accomplished. For this list, we're taking a look at games that seemingly stole a few ideas from others and wound up being more popular for it, and by more popular we mean a variety of things. Either better received by critics or fans, more commercially successful or more notable. We all on the same page. Excellent. I'm Ben from Triple Jump, and here are 10 video game copycats more popular than the original. Number 10. Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed the rivalry between Mario and Sonic is so long and storied that it's practically gospel within the gaming community and certainly needs no introduction from me. Despite Sonic being dubbed the fastest thing alive, it's Mario who rules the road as far as racing games go, and Mario Kart 7 sought to widen the lead by introducing new forms of vehicular shenanigans, including underwater tracks and gliders for aerial segments. Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed, released only a year later, seemed to run with the same idea, by giving cars the ability to transform into boats and planes mid-race. While both games reviewed about the same, settling around the mid-80s on Metacritic, Mario Kart 7 was more polarizing due to its odd decisions like the lack of a single-player versus mode and a questionable roster with some glaring omissions. On the flip side, Sonic and All-Stars was received with much more universal warmth for its robust single-player mode, extensive multiplayer options, and a roster that was notable more for strange inclusions rather than exclusions. With more installments having since been released in both series, Mario Kart 7 is now considered a bit of a black sheep, whilst Sonic and All-Stars is considered the peak of its own franchise. Sadly, Sonic's win here didn't translate to better sales, but at least he finally got to feel superior to Mario, even if only for a moment. Number 9. Street Fighter The history of fighting games is like a story my uncle might tell during the holidays, long-winded, meandering, and with many side tangents, though fortunately it contains more fight scenes than my uncle's stories do. Karate Champ is widely considered to be the title that pioneered the one-on-one -on -one fighting game and introduced many ideas that would become commonplace in the genre, such as special moves performed via directional inputs on the joystick and a best two out of three rounds system. It was a smash hit, being the most profitable arcade game of 1985 and one of the best-selling games of the 80s overall, probably because of its radical anime-style poster. Look at that! Other companies soon caught on, including a small up-and-comer named Capcom, who put out a little game called Street Fighter that clearly learned more than a few lessons from the reigning champion, right down to the suspiciously similar red and white gi-wearing main characters. Like Karate Champ, Street Fighter gives players an arsenal of thumb-twisting special moves, a two-player versus mode, and mini-games in between matches. The biggest difference between the two are that Street Fighter throws the player against a lineup of unique boss characters rather than a simple palette swap, and that it also went on to spawn one of the most celebrated franchises in all of gaming. Minor differences, really, in the end. Number 8. Guitar Hero the rock and roll rhythm game boom was a wild time to be a gamer as releases came thick and fast for several years, then suddenly vanished into the ether like a one-hit wonder, leaving behind nothing but empty servers and a second-hand market for overpriced plastic guitars. While it was Guitar Hero and Rock Band that ruled the roost, the craze actually began a few years before them with the release of arcade game Guitar Freaks that featured gameplay very similar to what people would be used to in the future, wherein the player had to strum a guitar-shaped peripheral along to a series of coloured notes scrolling up the screen. Guitar Freaks became a wildly successful franchise in Asia, even branching out into drum and keyboard-based games as well, but its popularity in the West was immediately overshadowed by the rise of Guitar Hero, an idea that was directly inspired by the popularity of Japanese music games like Guitar Freaks. The influence was perhaps a bit too obvious, as Konami, the publisher of Guitar Freaks, actually sued Harmonix, the creators of Guitar Hero and later Rock Band, for copyright infringement. The issue was ultimately settled out of court, and Konami would even help produce a Guitar Hero arcade game, and thus everyone was able to make sweet, sweet music together. Number 7. Pong Ok class, pop quiz time! What was the first ever video game console released for the home market? If you said the Magnavox Odyssey, you're correct. Well done! 
Looking like a veritable dinosaur by today's standards, the Odyssey was capable of displaying little more than a few dots and lines and required screen overlays or physical props for most of its games to function. Perhaps its crowning jewel was Table Tennis, a simple sports game that had two players using paddles to bounce a ball back and forth. The game was a hit, but duplicity was soon afoot as rival company Atari, another early name in the gaming industry, saw dollar signs in early demonstrations of table tennis and started work on their own version of it, an arcade game that they called Pong. Pong was obviously a roaring success, but Magnavox took notice of their suspiciously similar competitor and slapped Atari with a copyright infringement lawsuit. Atari settled out of court with a licensing agreement, but many other companies, including giants like Nintendo themselves, lost their court battles against the litigious Magnavox well into the 90s when their copyrights lapsed. With the dust finally settled, it's been estimated that Magnavox made over $100 million just from table tennis lawsuits alone. That's one way to squeeze money out of a good idea. Number 6. Carmageddon Ever since mankind first invented cars, we have been burdened with the inescapable urge to smash them into each other. This has given rise to many great innovations like bumper cars and demolition derbies and culminated with the creation of car combat video games. Twisted Metal is an absolute classic for the PlayStation and a beloved mainstay of late-night multiplayer sessions spent blowing each other into scrap metal with an arsenal of deadly weapons. Just some good, clean fun for the whole family. Similar games became a bit of a fad after that, though most of them aren't worth talking about except maybe for just how weird they could get. Carmageddon, which gets an a from me for the name alone, is the exception. It came out less than two years after Twisted Metal, and while it steered away from the arena-based setup, its similar penchant for gratuitous violence was undeniable. While you can ostensibly win in Carmageddon by simply being the first to cross the finish line, you also have the option of winning by wiping out your opponents or plowing through the most pedestrians. Both provided an excellent source of motorized mayhem, but Carmageddon zoomed past Twisted Metal in the review scores and even today is cited by many as the superior of the two. Number 5. Streets of Rage The world is a scary place, but it would be far less scary if we had more leaders like Mike Hagar, a former pro wrestler turned mayor who cracked down on crime with his own two hands and occasionally a length of pipe. Sadly, this is not the case, but it's a cracking good setup for a game, and thus Final Fight quickly became a quarter-munching sensation among arcade gamers who were drawn to the game's memorable characters and frenetic co-op action. Unfortunately, those same fans were left in the cold by a shoddy home port for the SNES that removed several levels, characters, and even multiplayer. Enter Streets of Rage, another beat-em-up game that took more than a little inspiration from Final Fight while still being very much its own beast with flashier moves to pull off and a soundtrack that wouldn't be out of place at a rave. Despite a few eyebrow-raising similarities, there was no question as to which game provided the better home console experience. While both series maintain strong and well-deserved legacies among Fisticuff fans to this day, Streets of Rage is the series that's receiving modern revivals and movie deals, while Final Fight devotees have had to make do with lackluster reboots and a few sparse cameos. Number 4. Call of Duty – War War never changes. And that statement seemed truer than ever in the late 90s and early 2000s, a time when every other game on the shelf seemed to be some variant of a first-person shooter set during World War II. Medal of Honor was actually the brainchild of film director Steven Spielberg, who envisioned the concept of a historical-based game that could be educational as well as entertaining. It was a winning formula, attracting positive reception and strong sales, and it wasn't long before a trend formed. World War II shooters from other companies soon entered the fray, including the first installments of the Battlefield and Call of Duty franchises, and within a few years players were being flooded by a surge of similar-looking games. Call of Duty decided to break ranks from its competitors by making the shift to a modern setting for its fourth installment, a choice that proved to be a breakthrough that catapulted the series to new heights. Medal of Honor followed suit a couple of years later, but by then it was too little too late for the one that started it all. Medal of Honor sales and reviews started to decline, while Call of Duty was soon raking in enough money to make King Midas jealous. Number 3. Sim City. Utopia, for the Intellivision, is a very old game, and when I say old, I mean that these were cutting-edge graphics at the time. And yet, for its era, it was extremely sophisticated. Two players compete head-to-head -to, -head to create the most successful civilization on their respective island by accruing resources, constructing buildings, and instigating rebel activity on their opponent's side. 
Incidentally, that's also what I like to call it when I steal my opponent's chess pieces when they're not looking. Oh, come on, calm down, it's just a bit of rebel activity. God, honestly. Gaming historians consider Utopia to be the first city-building simulation game, but nowadays when most people hear the terms simulation and city in the same sentence, their mind goes to a different series. SimCity was released almost seven years later and built on the foundations of Utopia, but took its ideas to a whole new level with more complex resource management and administration features as well as eschewing the multiplayer approach in favour of a single-player experience driven by goals like population milestones and disaster scenarios. SimCity would become only the first in a multi-million dollar franchise of simulation games, covering everything from golf to music to the healthcare system, eventually hitting upon the concept of focusing on the daily lives of regular people. That idea would become The Sims, and the rest, as they say, is history. Number 2. Uncharted the original Tomb Raider, with its solid gameplay and an iconic protagonist in Lara Croft, was a rousing success, and as it grew into a franchise, both it and its leading lady quickly became household names. By the time the early 2000s rolled around, however, Lady Croft was starting to run out of steam, and reviews for the Tomb Raider games quickly followed suit as the series hit a lull. As one star dimmed, another began to shine as the first game in the Uncharted series was released in 2007. Its focus on ancient ruins and legendary treasure elicited many early comparisons to Tomb Raider, with some even sarcastically labelling the newcomer Dude Raider. Uncharted proved to be a powerhouse in its own right, however, releasing to stellar reviews and excellent sales that propelled it to the top of the sales charts. Suppose you could say it was charted after all, eh? <laughs> Great one. While both series have cultivated strong legacies for themselves, Uncharted rose to prominence at a time when its predecessor was on the downswing, but since then, a successful reboot series has reignited the spark of the Tomb Raider series, proving that sometimes something just needs to stay buried for a while in order to become a treasure again. Hell yeah, archaeology jokes too! We've got it all here. Number 1. Arkanoid in a truly ironic twist of fate, Atari's own successful copycat, Pong, ended up becoming so popular that it spawned its own wave of copycats. In an effort to beat back the threat of market oversaturation, Pong was forced to evolve. Atari released a fresh slew of spin-offs and follow-ups, the most promising of which was Breakout, a single-player Pong variant that focused on bouncing the ball against a wall of blocks with the goal of destroying them all. Seriously, if I have to explain the gameplay of Breakout to you, you're probably too young to be watching this video. Breakout was a big success, but the series went dormant for a few years until Taito decided to break in with their own clone of Breakout known as Arkanoid, whose core gameplay was essentially the same except for one key addition that would change everything. Lasers. The formula was a hit all over again, wowing a new generation with flashy graphics and enhanced gameplay, ultimately going on to outshine its predecessor to the point that future takes came to be known as Arkanoid clones more often than Breakout clones. If there's one thing to learn from this story, however, it's that what goes around always ends up coming back around in the end. 